Okay, so again, I'm Paul Coates. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for sticking through uh, the challenges we've had this evening. I want to introduce Brother Manu Ampim. And many of you already know Manu. You know Manu because Manu has been a, a diligent scholar at work in our community. Um, Manu, I think we go back probably at least 20 years, and I know you've been doing this work longer than that. Manu is a scholar who, uh, one, academically, of course, uh, teaches, but more important than that, he spends his time in the field uh, doing his research, but also taking people uh, to Kemet and other places on the continent, uncovering uh, the, the vital history that we have as, as African people. Manu and I got together a few years ago because I became aware of his work on uh, Willie Lynch in addition to his other stuff. And I had been looking to work with someone to get a book done on Willie Lynch. And <laughs> Manu had already done it. Manu had begun an investigation and I, Manu, I'll let you take over um, the, the history of this, but I just want to say that following his work, I became aware of how detailed his work was and how he had uncovered the origins of the Willie Lynch letter, something that I was not able to do, how he had been able to do that, how he'd been in conversation, and how he began years ago dismantling this myth that just does not serve Black people. Manu, I'm going to let that serve for an introduction. And as we talk, I'll ask you some questions and we'll open this up as, uh, as much as possible to people. If you can put your questions in the chat, uh, we'll take the questions that we can and we'll have Manu respond to your questions as well as questions that I'll ask him. Manu, that's a rough introduction, brother, but I hope that it works. Again, I want to thank everyone on the call, and I especially want to thank Tony Browder for helping us get through this. Well, thank you, Brother Paul. I, I appreciate it. Well, you know, technical issues. Uh, I always tell my students that no matter what it is, you got to have some technical ability. So this is a piece of cake dealing with technical issues. I've had presentations in person when I was introduced, the lights went out. <laughs> and the mic went out in other cases. So this is a piece of cake. And when the lights went out, I told the audience in San Francisco, no worries. Uh, I'm still going to shed a little light on the subject anyway. So anyway, good to see you all. Um, I'm glad to share some of my primary research. I've uh, been doing firsthand research in Africana studies now for, for more than three decades. I actually met Brother Paul when I was a student at Morgan State University in the 80s. And so um, by him publishing black classic press books, we in our work study groups would read the books. We had, I don't know, Paul, if you remember, we had you come in one time and talk about Drusilla Dunda Houston's book, uh, The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire. But my work has been as a scholar uh, to do original research in dozens of countries. And regarding, um, so my work has, uh, has been noted by many uh, many credible scholars here in the U.S. and abroad. But regarding the, the Willie Lynch hoax, this is one of the, the biggest myths. I say it's the, the single greatest myth among Black folks in the, in the Western Hemisphere. And what happened and the way, the way I hooked up with Brother Paul in Black Classic Press, this was in 2011. We were at the Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta. And there were some brothers from, I think they were from Detroit, I believe, and they were publishing a, a publication called, a magazine called Our Story. And they asked if I can submit some of my writings on the Willie Lynch hoax. I said, sure. And they put some of my writings on the front cover. And Paul was sitting in the row behind me at the conference. So when these brothers were giving me extra copies to distribute, uh, Paul couldn't wait. He was anxious. He reached over me and grabbed my copies and said, brother, <laughs> we need to publish this. So before I even got a hold of the copies, he looked at the, uh, you know, the cover talking about the death of the Willie Lynch myth. And then uh, and told me that, look, I'm going to be in touch with you. We got to be able to challenge this out, this ongoing myth. And so that was really the beginning. And uh, sure enough, we, he collected my writings to publish it in the book, 
death of the Willie Lynch speech exposing the myths. Now, as a professional scholar and a professional historian, I've been teaching at the uh, at the academic level for many years. So um, I don't know exactly when, but I would say probably when I was in Baltimore, I came across as I normally would a lot of Mickey Mouse writings. So I probably put it in the file and when I moved back to California, I didn't think anything of it. But I noticed that as the internet was growing in influence, people were talking about this somehow this Willie Lynch myth and slavery. So for me, it's not really about looking at the past, although that's what I do professionally, is to look at the past and understand the past in order to create solutions in the present. But all too often, some people, they get stuck okay. in the past about, you know, how black folks got beat up by some outsiders and that we're doomed to be dominated by our opponent. So I wasn't too interested in just focusing on, um, on what some white demigod did to us and we had no response. So finally, I remember back in 2005 yeah. at one of the local centers, people were having a Ma'afa event, a Ma'afa in Swahili. As some of you know, it's the great disaster. And I said, so I was not interested in participating in it because of the fact that that's fine. We need to know. And as a historian, I'm, I'm yeah, as clear as anybody. We need to know exactly what has happened in the past in order to clarify the present so we can chart a solution in the future but I didn't want to be stuck in the past. So people were recommending that I participate in this panel discussion dealing with the great trauma that our people have experienced. And I, I uh, had reservations because again, I'm focusing on solutions and not just um, problems. And finally I said, well, look, since you all are recommending that I participate in this Ma'afa event, tell the organizer to contact me and I'll consider it. So after we discussed, I told her my concerns that if we are focusing on solutions, then I'll participate. But if it's just talking about what someone did to us, I'm not interested. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to spend my time, let me present something for the ages. And I thought about it. So you know what, why don't I present the greatest myth among black folks in the 20th and now the 21st century. And so that was back in 2005. And after I gave the presentation, then uh, people were stunned because they had never thought too much about it. And I said that not only was it an urban legend, but it does not serve us. It just shows us uh, being docile and dominated by others. And I also said this, that it's very clear that uh, there's no way that this is anything authentic because it's, it's in none of the writings. There's not one historian that has ever mentioned such a person giving a speech in 1712. And not only that, but it's not even used by the opposition. There's no slave owner records or sermons or any records whatsoever. And, you know, as a professional, we comb through all of the firsthand sources and documents. And I said that it's very clear if you really read the so-called letter, but it's supposed to be a speech in reality, you'll know that it's written by a brother who's in his 20s or 30s in age. He didn't know much about U.S. history. He may, he may have taken one class in Black studies, but he didn't know much about our experience in the U.S. And so, in other words, uh, the reason why I presented that and shared who it was that wrote it is because if you look at the details of this fantastic speech of supposedly how to control Black people for the next 300 years, uh, the details of how it was put together it clearly indicated it was somebody who was trying to quote unquote, wake us up. And that was using references and terms that had nothing to do with the 18th century in the US. For example, uh, in the, the fake and phony speech, the, uh, the person who put it together said that this was a plan to control black people. And they capitalized the, the word, uh, the B in the word black. The word B in black was never capitalized anywhere in the history of the US until the Black Power Movement emerged in June of 1966. So it was very clear that whoever put it together uh, probably came out of that era or was or familiar with that era, but uh, clearly was somebody on the inside who couldn't use the words that the slave owners and slave traders and slave masters would have used, which was uh, Negroes or nigger or something like that. those are the words they would have used, but nobody would have used the word in the 1700s. They certainly would not have used the word black with a capital B. Also, uh, 
there was a reference to this is how you control black people for the next 300 years and the word um the word lynch uh, the it was a a reference to someone being lynched in a tree <laughs> so i said well this clearly is someone who doesn't understand the history no one uh, uh as vicious as white folks were in the 1700s 1800s you name it there was no lynching in a tree until after the civil war so in other words, you see this taking place in the late 1800s, not 150 years later in 1712. And then just basic things that anybody had taken one class in US history would have understood. And then there were other things such as, uh, which is why I knew it was just you know, a phony attempt to quote, wake us up. But also it was this idea of um, uh, referring to King James. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, the only people really who think King James is all of that are those that are either some, someone who is a, a, a biblical scholar who might look at some of the influence of King James or mainly black folks who, who are familiar with the King James version. But in 1712, very few people in England would have thought much of anything about King James because he had ruled and died a hundred years earlier. So Queen Anne would have been the reference in the 1700s rather than someone who had lived a century earlier. Let me give you a comparison. We're now in 2021. So without looking it up online, who was the US president a hundred years ago? Now you all are a little bit older, so I'm sure that you are familiar with US history, but guess what? I know very few of you would know who was the president 100 years ago. Now, if you're one of the few that can mention the president's name, then you would be just that, one of the few. And that president is somebody that is pretty important because of the fact that he led the country into World War I. But yet most of you would not know who the president was 100 years ago or a century ago. So King James is, some, is a name that would resonate with most of us. So the, the person who put it together was aware of a certain amount of information that would influence us, including the name Lynch. So when I uh, did that presentation in 2005, then my colleague in England asked, could I publish my presentation? And so uh, next thing I know, I did part one and there was massive response. Then I had to do part two to explain what the responses were to part one and the writings and information just took off. It took, it took on a life of its own, including Paul Coulter said, brother, we got to publish what you've written. But for me, I was done with it because um, we have much work to do to deal with the reality of where we are. Now, let me just say this uh, about, about this scenario. It is much more easy and, and simpler for somebody to read a eight paragraph Ripley's Believe It or Not account of what happened to black folks rather than read the three or 400 word autobiography of Frederick Douglass. If somebody really wants to know what happened, read Frederick Douglass. There's nobody more insightful than Douglass about what the opposition and the opponents have done to us. If they want to look at uh, victimization and what happened to us, there's no question that slavery is one of the most it is the most brutal system that we can ever imagine uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the history of the world, or certainly the, the history of the modern world. So there's no question about that. But guess what? There's always been Black cultural resistance, African cultural resistance. So to assume that one white man gave a speech in 1712, and this little Ripley, believe it or not, eight paragraph speech is somehow going to explain why we're in the quagmire in the predicament that we're in today is really s silly, is superficial, and has nothing to do with facts. In fact, it's very disrespectful because if anybody reads, for example, uh, Herbert Aftheker in his book, American Negro Slave Revolts, which is a classic, you know that there was always resistance. And not only is there the resistance of rebellions, organized rebellions, I'm not just talking about Nat Turner, I'm talking about uh, uh, Aptheker counts more than 200. Yes, he does. And not only that, but if anybody understood or even read Sterling Stuckey's slave culture, then we would know that the, that the ring shout and other community rituals and ceremonies kept us intact. That as vicious as the slave system was, that it still could not break up and destroy 
the African system of sharing and caring. Even, even when these outrageous people sold a mother or a father or sold off the children, sold off the children, we never had a concept of the nuclear family, mother, father, and children in one single household. We had the extended family, in other words, mama and them. And so therefore, even if a father was sold out, sold away, another brother in, on the plantation would step up and play the role of father. And to not understand those dynamics is a systematic failure to understand the internal dynamics of African culture on the plantations. So there's no Willie Lynch or any other kind of system that destroyed our process. In fact, if you read the autobiographies of enslaved Africans and written accounts of them, if we listen, you can still listen to the audio recordings of the so-called slave narratives, or even look at the census reports. We know that most people were still reporting to parent households, even into the 1960s, that the family was not destroyed. Look at Blasting Game's work. Look at Goodman and the, the Black family and slavery and freedom. And so even though we had major hurdles to overcome, it didn't destroy the system. And so, well, well wait a minute, Professor, what do you mean? Well, look, look at us now. Yes, this is now. What has happened over the last 30, 30 years has changed what has happened to us in the country. But we can't look at what's happening today and then superficially say, oh, well, it must have always been that way. That's not how the world works. The world changes, conducts change, battles change, outcomes change, everything changes. Think about this. You all know, and I'm looking here, from your age, I know for a fact, most of you are quite aware that it is quite new for there to be a difference between elders and young people and, and a great rift in our community. Young people before the last 30 years or so show the utmost respect for elders in the community, whether you were the biological mama or daddy or not. And you know that's the case. I grew up in San Francisco. I was born in Alabama. I grew up in San Francisco, even on the West Coast. We still had a sense of community. So when my mother and father went to uh, work, guess what? The neighbor across the hall took care of us. Uh, uh, Mr. Perry at the ice cream parlor, if, if we were out of pocket, he would chastise us. Or Mr. Wilson selling the meat across the street, he would chastise us and get in our behind. And when my parents came, guess what? We got double that. And so nobody dared say, you ain't my daddy, don't touch me. Nobody would ever say that. As a matter of fact, I was an adult before I knew that Uncle Choo Choo was not really my Uncle Choo Choo. <laughs> he wasn't my biological uncle or that Aunt Gladys wasn't a biological aunt. But we didn't. We don't think that way. We didn't think that way. In fact, when somebody's close to us, who in our youth do it now, if somebody's close to them, they call them they what? What do they call them if they have a, somebody that's close to them? My cousin. We always, we've always had a sense of community. So to suggest that some lone bad white boy, some superstar, a demigod, gave one speech in 1712, and somehow that is the definitive definition of why black folks have problems today. It is a Ripley, Ripley's Believe It or Not approach that has nothing to do with facts. And so, so since I, I wrote the, the book and published by Black Classic Press, people have shifted from saying, yes, the Willie Lynch speech is real, to res, uh, resorting to a new position. Well, you know, it may not be real, but it, it still kind of happened that way. Well, first of all, it didn't happen that way. It makes no sense. First of all, the Willie Lynch speech, and, I, and I'm, I'm just giving you an overview because I'm assuming everyone doesn't necessarily have the details, and then I'll, we'll open it up. But here's what the speech claims, so-called letter. Here's what it claims, that the slave owners were dividing Black people on the basis of... <laughs> Yes. Can I, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you just for one quick moment, please. So when, when Manu goes through these categorizations, can you please look at yourself and will you drop into the chat where you fit <laughs> as he goes through these categorizations? It'll be an interesting, interesting thing. So I'm sorry to cut across you, brother, but I thought we could get some of that interactive stuff in. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I appreciate. It. I love interaction. I just, I, I, I just know it's such a hot topic. If I don't lay it out, somebody's <laughs> gonna, they're gonna come in and, and kind of miss the big picture. So, um, 
here's the deal. And what Brother Paul is getting at is this. And let me explain what the speech claims and what the reality is. And so, um, and then I'll finish. But I, but what he's also getting at is this: is that when I, when I first presented my death of the Willie Lynch speech in writing, there were you, you have no idea. I mean, tons of people all over the country, Canada, the Caribbean, contacted me because this was stunning. It was shocking uh, when I, in 2005, presented this. And, uh, and then there were three type of responses, three responses. And 90% uh, of the people were in the first two categories. But the first category were those people contacted me and said, brother, thank you. I knew there was something off about this, this so-called letter but I just didn't know what it was. Or I didn't have the ammunition. And I told people that I don't know about it, uh, if we should adopt this, but thank you, brother, because your writings on a death of the Willie Lynch speech exposing the myth has been very clear. So that's the first category, those that knew it was fake and phony, but they just didn't have the ammunition and the artillery. Now, the second group is a group that I have a lot of respect for. The second group of honest people who said, brother, this is amazing. I've been telling my network, my friends, my family, people that I mentor about Willie Lynch. And I thought it was real. I thought that this was like the smoking gun to help us understand why we have the problems that we have today. And when I read what you had to say, I, they, they said, damn, this is <laughs> this, this has changed, this changed my process. And so the second category are those brothers and sisters who were open and candid and said, you know what, brother, because you wrote what you've done and laid it out in, in, in this manner, I've reversed myself 180 degrees. Not only am I not going to promote this anymore, but I'm going to go back to my network and say, you know what, I was wrong. You know, my, my, my intentions were right, but I was totally wrong about this. We need to abandon this Willie Lynch stuff. That's the second group. So those two groups are in the 90% category. Then guess what? The 10%. The 10%, it doesn't matter what anybody says or does, they are definitely saying, you know what? I have my mind made up and I dare you give me facts. I dare you, don't challenge me with no facts. I, this is, hey, I, I need this. And there's people that are upset, they're mad, and they actually wanna do something physical because uh, they got challenged and exposed. And so that 10%, they're not gonna change. You never can get everybody. We're not looking for everybody. We're just looking for, guess what? The critical mass. So those are the, those are the three groups. And so there's been a lot of people that have made it very clear, you know, what category they're in. So that's what Brother Paul is talking about. You know, which of the three categories you're in? The, the group that said, you know, I knew it was something fishy and shaky about this, number one. Number two, um, I'm rethinking this. And then number three, that, hey, it, it doesn't matter what anybody says. Now, here's the deal. Um, when I said who it was, a brother in his 20s or 30s who didn't know much about U.S. history, the person who confessed to writing this Willie Lynch speech or so-called letter, he came forth. He said, you know what? It was me. So Kwamina uh, uh, Bashim Ashanti, who's now retired, but he was at the University of, of uh, North Carolina at Durham, He's the one that contacted me in 2009 and wrote a confession letter that we put in the book. So I don't know, I didn't know who he was. So I was getting so many letters and contacts. I saw his letter, I just put it in the file. I said, you know, I'll get to it later. And then months later, I got, I had some downtime. A family member was in the hospital, had some downtime. And I said, let me go through the emails. And I saw this email from him with the confession letter. And here's what he said. Uh, he said that when he read that I said it was an African male, African American male in his 20s or 30s, who didn't know much about US history, maybe took a one black studies class, but uh, that's about it. But that's who wrote this and I'm clear about it. He said that when he saw my description, this is what his words were. He said, damn, the brother got me. And that's why he wrote the confession letter. And so now uh, Fashima Shante has been on, on the internet. He's been on interviews, but just understand, he didn't come out on his own. We forced him out. And, and by the way, when he wrote his letter, I'm not, I, I'm a professional researcher. Anybody can make claims. This is what I do every day at Contra Costa College. And, you know, and so 
Um, so I, I said, man, he wrote a confession letter. I said, let me call him. So I called him immediately from the hospital. And guess what? I had a list of questions to interrogate him in an intense interview to ask him a whole bunch of questions to see if this even makes sense. And guess what? He made a lot of stuff. I said, why did you choose the name Willie Lynch? He said, well, I just kind of needed a name and, and Willie's kind of popular in the South and Lynch, I thought I would get an emotional impact. So uh, it makes sense. Uh, and and now, now think about this. Uh, his background is in psychology. He is a, a, a long-term member at a, at, a, at a respected college. So he's got a lot to lose. He wasn't retired at the time, but guess what his specialty was, Ashante? He specialized in brainwashing, literally. That's a specialty area, to brainwash students to think more highly about themselves. And this is what he's doing at the college. So then I, I asked a whole lot of questions. I said, well, why did you write it in the first place? I said, well, I didn't think anything of it, really. He said, in Durham, we didn't have any bookstores in, uh, in the 70s. And he said he wrote it in 1979. That's what he said, 1979. Now, remember, now as a researcher, um, it, uh, you know, uh, I'm not concerned with a statement, but, but, you know, documentation beats conversation every day of the week. So I'm looking to see if this even make his, any sense. Well, why did you write? He said, well, you know, we had a study group, but we didn't have a bookstore. So if we didn't have any literature to, uh, or, or any knowledge about what we wanted to say, we would just make a leaflet and get it out to the community. He said he didn't even think anything of it. I said, what did you think about when Louis Farrakhan made the statement and elevated the Willie Lynch idea at the Million Man March in 1995? I said, yeah, I heard it. And he said he was a little bit surprised that it was um, out there on an international stage. I said, what did you do? He said, well, I didn't do anything. I said, well, why did you respond to my uh, writing? He said, well, you, you, you caught me. And I said, well, yeah, he said that he was in Durham. He said he was in his uh, 30s at the time. He said he didn't know much about U.S. history. He had an interest in, but didn't know anything about black studies. So he's saying why it is that he said, damn, the brother got me because I laid it out. Well, well Professor, why would you say somebody in their 20s or 30s? Because a teenager would not be that savvy to mention, for example, King James or lynching, they wouldn't know that. And then guess what? Somebody in their 40s, they got better things to do with their time than just to make up a myth. Because, you know, somebody in their 40s, why not just promote Kenneth Stamp's book, The Peculiar Institution, to lay out the five uh, strategies to, to enslave Black folks, if that's what you want to do. Or somebody in their 40s or older, they probably would have read, which I promote, if you want to really see what happened, read Paul Finkelman's work, Defending Slavery. It's an excellent work. And Paul Finkelman is a great uh, constitutional and legal scholar. And his work is very important because he looks at the sermons, the, doc, uh, the, the speeches and important documents that had tremendous influence in, the, in, um, in slave plantations and slave, in, in cities regarding slavery. It's pro-slavery ideas and thought. And nobody anywhere said a word about any Willie Lynch until it emerges in the late 20th century. And so, and besides, no documents just, just uh, emerge out of thin air and go poof. Where's the original document? There is not one. So I was telling, so I'm asking his brother these questions and it made a lot of sense. So guess what? After that first interrogation, I wrote down detailed notes and I investigated what he told me. Everything he told me checked out. So we had a second interview. And I went through it again. And after two interviews with uh, Fashim um, Ashante, I said, you know what? It's very clear to me that uh, it is highly likely that he's right, that he is the original author of the original uh, Willie Lynch speech or Willie Lynch uh, letter. And uh, then after that time, when we started to, uh, um, when I started to, to um, get contact from people to do interviews and then brother Paul contacted me after that Ashanti started to talk about um, that he's the original author and he said 1979 in his original that's in the book it's in the book in the original confession but I heard him on the radio later saying 1976 instead of 79 that contradicts what he has to work out that still does not alter my opinion as a professional researcher 
that um, that uh, he is likely the original author because all of it really makes sense what he said and he had more to lose than he had to gain at the time by being a uh, professional at a at a university. You certainly do not want to have your reputation tarnished because you've been involved with some Mickey Mouse operation. So, uh, but basically, let me just say this, and I, then I'll open it up because our time is going. I do appreciate you all's time, but uh, just two things I want to mention to you. Here's what is claimed in the speech, which makes no sense because it wasn't done this way. The Willie Lynch tactics are claimed to be to divide black people on tall and short. <laughs> really? This is some 20s, tw this is some 20s for 20th century nonsense, or to divide black people in the terms of male and female. Now, this one is emotional for some people. We, we were on uh, the Carl Nelson show a few days ago, and somebody was saying that, yeah, well, brother, you know, we got problems with brothers and sisters, and this has to be true in the letter. Um, and so guess what I asked him? Simple question. How long has the male-female conflict been going on? Our oh, brother's been going on 40 years. Exactly. That's my point. We're dealing with issues that have emerged in the, the 20th century. That's my point. But there's no male and female conflict in the 1700s. I didn't say everything was perfect. That makes no sense. But there's no male-female conflict. That's a new phenomenon. And then uh, the, 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 the Willie Lynch mythology says that the uh, black folks were divided on dark skin and light skin. Are you kidding me? Find a single shred of evidence because documentation beats conversation that that is true or makes any sense. Not at all. Because uh, that's, that's what they did try to divide people, uh, black people on is not any of those, but on ethnic origin, to divide those from the same ethnic group so that they couldn't communicate, to divide people in the same language family so that they couldn't communicate. Um, then there were divisions based on um, on class. So if somebody and somehow maybe they had a a uh, inside home, you know, um, uh, a work in the big house, maybe give those persons a little bit more perks versus those out in the field. Those were attempted areas to divide people, you know, but certainly not yeah. color, certainly not male, female, or young and old. These these are new issues. So what I would say is this is um, so I'll wrap it up in this way is that slavery was a vicious system, but to be able to come out of this vicious system that lasted for two and a half centuries and then to overcome another hundred years of vicious Jim Crow racism and now the, the more recent 50 years of white nationalism, we must be a bad people to be able to overcome all of this, but to give Willie Lynch and by the way, that's, a, that's even a question. Will he lynch? Yes, he will lynch. <laughs> He'll lynch, all right. You know, and so, but we were able to resist. Are, um, are there scars? Of course there's scars. Tonight, for example, uh, CNN is, is, is just, some of you are watching this series on um, how Beulah Mae Donald took down the Klan, the lynching of Michael Donald in 1981. So there's scars that continue. We know that. But we cannot dismiss a whole tradition of struggle and triumph. Yes, we've, we've had losses too, but it's not just some we the victim, we get our behind handed to us on a planter and then, you know, the white boys, the super, you know, the superstar that beats down everybody. They, they, they are just more diligent than what we've been sometime, but we continue to move forward. And I think that's why it's good to see you all. Lastly, I want to say this, if we're going to solve our problems, we have to be uh, savvy and understand that the 20th century was not kind to black people. These are the three issues that we're trying to overcome now. And we are more at, at a deficit from the 20th century than from slavery. Doesn't mean I'm just dismissing the brutality of slavery, but I am saying that we were able to overcome uh, some of that, much of it, but we were hit with the 20th century. Three things we need to know. Number one, the migrations from the South. Up until World War I, 90% of Black folks still lived in the South in rural areas, the rural South, until uh, the 19s or the 1920s. That's when we went to Harlem and Baltimore and Detroit and other places, Chicago. We went from plantation to ghetto. Yes, we did. We went from plantation to ghetto. We transformed Harlem. Harlem was a Jewish community. Black folks went in, and it was so much creativity. It's the Harlem Renaissance because of the Black genius, people migrating in. But there was a lot of uh, race 
massacres that took place. That's why it's Rosewood, Florida in 1923, or you know Black Wall Street or Greenwood in 1921, and so many other places, East St. Louis, because we migrated into those areas, then white folks did not want Black people to go into their neighborhoods, take so-called take their jobs. So we went from plantation to, uh, to ghetto and lots of urban unrest. Not only that, so the migrations, we migrated, we did the best we could, but the migration, the urbanization and integration, those are the three things I'd like you to remember. The migrations, the urbanizations and the integration. If you look at those three things, you'll see that in each one of those cases, we lost quite a lot. And there's a lot of scholars, folks, who are not supporting white supremacy at all. I'm talking about from our own community who know that from 1968, the late 60s to now, we've suffered greatly at all of these changes by the breakup of the family, the loss of a sense of community. You tell me when somebody can tell an elder, get your damn hands off of me, you ain't my daddy. Who's, who would say that up until the last couple uh, generations? we would never had anything like that before. Or look at what happened to the divorce rate. Look at what happened with the, with the uh, Family Law Act of 1969. When that went into effect in 1970, we had a proliferation of divorces all of a sudden. And Ronald Reagan is the one who signed that into law first in California. And, and the Family Law Act, you know, one of the main provisions was a no fault divorce bill, no fault divorce. And, and now every state in the country has some version of the no fault divorce bill. In other words, before the no fault divorce bill, you couldn't just divorce. You had to actually show that the other spouse was at fault for either abuse or the alienation of affection or something like that. You had to prove that and very difficult to prove. But with the Family Law Act, no, no fault divorce bill, now you can just break up because of what? Irreconcilable differences. And then you saw a breakup. And so, you know, in the 80s, 90s, half of people who married were divorced. So I would joke with people and say the greatest cause of divorce is marriage itself. <laughs> So anyway, and then look at what happened with the government introducing drugs into our community. We have to look at how this broke up our system and then, you know, the whole welfare system. So uh, look, let's not be, uh, let's put in context everything that I said and not isolate something I said in order to make a point. I said that slavery was vicious. It was brutal is probably the worst system in the history of humanity, but guess what? Give black folks credit for being able to stand up and challenge these vicious racists and come out of slavery with some sense of sanity and community and still be able to move forward. And so it's always an ongoing ebb and flow, a give and take. So it's not just give a speech and that's the end of it. No, it's an ongoing battle and, and this is what has happened. So we just, did not do as well as we needed to do in the 20th century. Even with the great movement for civil and human rights in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, guess what? There was a conservative counter movement to reverse as many gains as possible. And you saw the madman that just left the White House. That's He's an ultimate conservative anti-Black <laughs> racist, but mm -hmm. he comes out of a larger movement. So that's anyway, that's the point I wanted to make folks is that, and finally, um, and thank you for listening, Listen. but let me just show you, uh, I'm sorry. Um, no, no, no. Yes. Let me do let me do um, two things here, and, and okay. I'm gonna turn it right back to you. Okay. 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 Um, first of all, again, I'm gonna thank everyone for being on the call. I really thank you for being on the call. I'm glad that you get the benefit of listening to Manu. Um, we started a little bit late, but we do have time for some questions. Please drop whatever questions you have in the chat. Here's the thing, we built this as a conversation between Manu and Paul Coates. The real deal is when we did call Nelson the other day, I made a decision to let Manu carry the ball. Okay, so that's what y'all just got. <laughs> because it's not too much more that I have to say, I'm, I'm gonna agree with Manu like uh, 100%. And he's quite effective in delivering his presentation because this is something he works in and has worked in for uh, so long. At the same time, there is room for your questions. I have a few questions to start off. Nat, do we have questions in chat at this point? 
we have one question, but we also have um, folks who did respond to Manu's question about which categories folks fit into. So okay. not everybody responded. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping we don't have to make an assumption about the rest of the people who didn't. So, okay. You want me to share that? Or you, you go ahead and I'll come back in a little bit. Well, well yeah, I guess we can. The, the thing is like, I thanked everyone for being on the call. I really thank Manu because here's the deal. When I cross Manu doing this work, and Manu, thank you for reminding me because it's been that long, brother. I forgot that we crossed at, at Morgan, okay? Yes. I forgot, that's where we go back to. We go back to Morgan and somehow it escaped me. But here's the deal. I'm thanking Manu also because Manu is the person who called me and told me he could not get into the chat. So he's the one who alerted me um, when we got to that number that we had a problem. And he's done that several times <laughs> as we've structured the call. So Manu, it's a blessing, brother. It really, really is a blessing. I do want to emphasize a point that, that you're making. And then, Ned, I'll, I'll just uh, fling it, uh, you know, toss it back to you. Um, and of course, um, I'll give it back to Manu again. Manu, I feel and I've always felt, the, you, you said this, you already said this, and that is the manufacturing of myths that do not serve our purpose. You know, you didn't say it in this words, but I mean, this is deadly business here. It's deadly business when you really understand when we take into account that myths are such a powerful force that people use to move through life. You know, like we, we, we use myths like John Henry. We use myths like High John the Conqueror. These are empowering myths that, that, that was created by our people and told to people when they were very young. Empowering myths. And now we got a myth that's disempowering. I really think like if, if this was done by someone outside of black people, I probably could understand it better, Manu. But the ignorance of somebody not seeing to repeat stereotypes and put this together to not understand how damaging that could be. And then to have Farrakhan. For example, all I could do at the Million Man, I wasn't at the Million Man March, I was listening to it. All I could do was just shake my head. I mean, I mean, how could you go on? And here's the thing. I've been in set, I've been in sessions. It's not, it's not a Muslim thing. I've been in sessions in church, in the Christian church, and heard ministers say this, repeating the same thing because it's a, a narrative that fits into something. It's a myth that fits into something. Not understanding at the same time it's a disempowering myth. And I think you're right um, that one of the things it does is it gives a single white man, a single white man, the capacity to figure out Black people who are thousands of years old, who, who think very complexly, this white man has figured out how to break us. And all he has to do is talk to another group of white people, white men that is, about how to break us. I really, um, like, like we talked the other day and, and we don't know where this guy is or what, what happened to him at this point, Manu, but I think it's, I, I really, really, the things I wanna say, I can't say. And part of the reason I was quiet today also, Manu, was because when we were on the radio, I, my blood vessels was getting ready to pop. <laughs> and you were so calm in doing your presentation as you were as you were today. So I really wanna thank you. I know you have more things to say. I wanted to get that in. And I just wanna check with Ned uh, because maybe the things you can say, Manu, can come with uh, questions. Do we have questions at this we point? Do. We do, and just so you know, so- Is that okay, Manu, if we proceed that way? Brother Shabazz had his hand up for a while. Okay, thank you, brother. Okay, so we will look for Brother Shabazz's question. We are asking folks to please put your questions in the chat. Um, we know sometimes that's a challenge, but we have a couple other questions. Um, and 
in response, um, Brother Manu, to your question, right now we have seven folks on the call who considered themselves as being in category one. We have nine folks who responded that they are in category two. And we have not had anyone admit that they are in category three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's our latest count. That's our latest count. Um, and so I know that some people may have come in late or not, but one of the questions that's come up is, and, and I was in and out too, so I'm not sure if it was addressed, is um, in the conversation with the confessor, did he clarify what his motivation was or did you not even care? Uh, no, I, I, I did ask uh, Kwabana Fashi Mashante about his motivation and uh, he said that he created this um, kind of note and he attributed to Willie Lynch so that he can get us uh, so he can quote wake us up is what he said to try to motivate us to recognize that we have problems and we should be active and that seemed obvious to me from the uh, from the so-called Willie Lynch speech but that's what he actually said I thought that was kind of obvious. So I didn't say anything to him until I asked him, why did he write it? And he said, actually, he said that um, it wasn't just that. Uh, Kwame Nafashima Shanti said in Durham, they created a lot of leaflets. And again, as I mentioned earlier, and the leaflets would be based on information they had, they would just put it in leaflet form. And he said, if, if they didn't have the information, just made it up. So, well, it must have been like this in a general way, and they just made it up. So he said that when he put together this um, so-called Willie Lynch kind of leaflet, he never really thought much about it because it was what he was doing along with his group on a regular basis. So the motivation was just to try to get us to recognize we got, we got issues. But um, anybody that looks around can see we got issues. You go to any any city in the country where there's a lot of black folks you have suffering. You go to any Martin Luther King Boulevard in the country, you know that that's where <clears throat> you find poverty and drugs. And any truck driver knows that if you want to look for drugs, find Martin Luther King Boulevard around the country and you will find the drugs. So um, this is not anything that, and you know, look at Hurricane Katrina and the aftermath. You know, look at how the nation has responded to all of these atrocities that have taken place, including the George Floyd. You got nine and a half minutes of video and still there's still a debate. So we didn't need some letter, but if you wanted to put together a speech, fine. But but that's what his motivation was. That's 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 what he uh, claims, that that's what motivated him to try to quote, wake us up. And do you know whether or not he used any of what he thought were brainwashing techniques in that? Did he discuss that? That's one of the questions. I did not ask him specifically about brainwashing, but we did discuss brainwashing. And in general, as <laughs> Sister Natalie, Natalie, when we were discussing brainwashing, his, his approach would be to take freshman students at the college and then try to brainwash them to think more positively about themselves, that they can achieve academic success at the college level. And so it was pretty obvious he was mentioning that to say that's his professional background work that he does officially, but that's also what he was doing in this um, in the speech as well. But the problem is, is that if anybody reads the so-called Willie Lynch speech, there's nothing to do. All it is is just who handed our ass to us, you know, and how they handed it to us, and that's it. So we walk away as a victim. There's no plan. There's no program to do anything. That's why it's always uh, curious and without credibility for somebody said they were so motivated when they're motivated by what? When has there not been a time where black folks have not been under siege? What is it, what is it that you don't see? I mean, like, for example, somebody please tell me um, or just guess. I think you can, you can what is arguably the most popular speech in the history of this country. Somebody can either say it or put it in the, what's the arguably the most popular speech in the history of the country? I have a dream. Exactly, very good. Yes, I, I have a dream and guess what? How many of you know that twice in the, the I have a dream speech given on, on August 28th, 1963, that Dr. King mentions twice the horrors of police brutality. 
Most people don't even know it. They haven't even read the speech. They haven't listened to the 16 minute speech. So when, when have we not been under siege by the police? When has there not been white violence to literally kill off black folks if they don't in a whole town or city or community if they don't like it? Whether, it, we don't, whether it's Greenwood, whether it's uh, Philadelphia, it doesn't matter where it is, where, whether it's Wilmington, there's always been black folks under siege. So there's no, no need to create a phony and fake document. Look at the ongoing reality to see that this is what we're, we're up against. So, um, but here you've got a popular speech that's right in front of us. And yet people uh, don't really look at the details of what it is that Dr. King said. You know what I do with the I Have a Dream speech? I flip the script. Yeah, so thank you. So American Rhetoric, thank you, Brian, for putting that in the chat. So what I tell people, listen at the 16 minute I Have a Dream speech. And here's what I do. I play the tw first 12 minutes and I stop it. And what the media does, they skip the first 12 minutes, they go to the last <laughs> three to four minutes because Dr. King was there to talk about the American reality that black folks still uh, are struggling against this vicious system. And as he talked about the horrors of police brutality, and as he said, the vicious racists in Alabama, when he talks about the American reality, King did not leave people on a down note or a sour note. As an activist, you don't leave people on a down note. You give them something to do. So therefore, at the end of the speech, King said, despite all of these issues, I still have a dream that one day America could be a certain way. That's not what he was there to do, dream. He's one of the most important practical activists in the history of the country. And yet uh, people don't look at his plan and program and what he was actually doing because of the propaganda. So, uh, but even then, my point is that even in the most popular speech, you still have the condemnation of vicious white nationalism and he was unswerving in the criticism in that speech or any other speech or that you wanna look at beyond Vietnam and his condemnation of the American government that he said was running amok with racism. So there's nobody that has been um, any spokesperson or organization that has not pointed out these issues and problems all along the way. We didn't need to create some uh, phony document that didn't exist. And besides, people lose credibility when they present some, some uh, outrageous, unnecessary uh, speech, as opposed to dealing with the reality of what's happening today. And besides, so um, one other last thing I would say is that uh, why should this matter one way or another? Because an activist must always be concerned with solving problems. The purpose of study is to clarify the work that has to be done. So if a person is an activist who's looking to solve problems and to help build and develop the community, we must know very clearly the origins of a problem in order to solve that problem. So those people say, well, okay, well, maybe the speech is not real, but it doesn't matter. We still got problems. No, it does matter. It doesn't matter to the non-activists because they don't plan to do very much. So to them, make up any kind of Mary Poppins, Alice in Wonderland approach to a problem because they don't plan to solve a problem. Any activist knows you must dissect the origins and development of a problem in order to do what? Solve that problem. This is why it matters. And if anybody, so that's what it's about, solving problems by looking at the origins of the problems. And that's why we got to look carefully at the 20th century and its negative impact, because we didn't do all of what we needed to do as these problems develop. And uh, we now have these kind of issues that we didn't have before. You know, so that's what I would say that what, we what, have to do. What else you got in there? So there's another question on here. Um, it's a little long, but this is this is um, Brother Leroy, not Tacky Cassie. Okay, ask this question. It says, your book mentions that crack cocaine being introduced to black communities mm -hmm. in the latter part of the 20th century was a large contributor towards many of the negative aspects of life that currently plague black communities today. Would you say that a plan is necessary in order to recover from the systemic effects that stem from the crack epidemic, more so than the perceived effects that stem from the enslavement of our ancestors or the institution of slavery? And if so, what do you think the first step is? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, we still have people right now that um, you know their parents got caught up in that and it, it affected every community. I mean, who didn't know somebody who was negatively affected by crack? Immediate family members, close 
close friends and we have children that are suffering from that. I have students right now that attend my classes that are suffering because they, their parents weren't able to really care for them. Well, we have to be able to, to uh, deal with the issue of drugs and unemployment and homelessness in our community. Uh, so we don't have to leap back to slavery to address that. Keep in mind that we did have communities. We had Africatown, for example, in Mobile. Africatown was a, a, a thriving community in the early part of the 20th century. We, we, we had uh, Allensworth here in California as well. Uh, for, by the way, uh, Africatown's in, uh, in Mobile, Alabama area. And we had other communities. So yes, we had struggles. Yes, it was the vicious Jim Crow era. But we also had great examples of, of community. So some of you know about uh, the Greenwood District and, and Tulsa and other places. So we've, we've, we've had pockets where we were able to have a sense of community and make progress despite slavery. But keep in mind that the world is not static, nor are our opponents static. They constantly have an agenda that they promote and push on a regular basis. The world changes time change, and so we too must change. So absolutely, we must address it by uh, working to have a sense of community. We need more programs in the community and more people volunteering or working in programs to help clean up the problem of drugs in our community. We have to create jobs in order to address this issue, but we lost opportunities that we can revisit. If, like for example, I mean, a lot of you, I, I can tell by your age, you know, or, or participated in independent black schools. But guess what? The independent black schools were a start, but we never had a full system. The way in which we, what we needed to do and can do, begin to deal with the economic issues, they're attached to the educational issues, which are attached to the health issues. For example, we've never had a viable K through 12 independent school system that's linked to an economic system. We've never had that. We have independent schools that there's pockets, they may deal with elementary or middle school or maybe middle and high school, these independent schools, but then they're not attached to an economic system where they are, are taught entrepreneurship, that they have the kind of internship with black businesses that they can go in and work in those businesses. And we, we, we have not had that. And if you say, well, no, wait a minute, we, we did this in this one city, it's not enough. So, but that's the key. We really have to have more of a sense of community and link a, a complete educational system, not pockets of it. And that's linked to the, the, uh, the educational component, but we, we, we never completely put that together. We've had efforts. I didn't say we didn't have efforts and we had pockets, but we never had a complete system. So for me, all of these things are linked and that's what has to be done. And, and by the way, one other thing I might add is that, um, you know, we, uh, we've we tried, you know, we've made some progress, but look what came out of the great movement in the 60s. We've had the rites of passage systems, but guess what? None of them were totally complete. We took parts of the African traditional uh, system from, from birth to death and beyond, but there's five major African initiation rites. So we had many people who, have, who, who organized rites of passage for young people but you can't teach what you don't know. Not only that, but it's, it's got to be a complete system. So, so the right of birth, the right of adulthood, the right of marriage, the right of eldership. And keep in mind, there's a fundamental difference between an elder and an older person. They're not the same. Eldership and ownership are completely different in African culture. And so is there a difference between an ancestor and a dead relative. They're totally different. And we have to know that these are completely different groups. So if we had a system, a complete system, and not only dealing with the rites of passage to adulthood, then we would make better um, progress. So this is what we have to do is look more at the African traditional system to address the question that you're, that you're asking, brother. So it's not a simple question, but you're right, it's an important one. And, and I, absolutely, I maintain we would have to deal with the drug issue and all of that crack and so forth and not simply just get stuck on the plantation because uh, uh, it's, it's more than that. It's bigger than that. And we have to recognize that we got to move on as much as possible, but not, but never forget, never, never, never for, 
forgive those criminals who continue. It's not just slavery in that city, it's slavery plus 100 years of Jim Crow, plus another 50 years of ongoing vicious white nationalism. So uh, yes, so we must always understand it, but also understand that things have changed. And so we too must change, but also make sure we have a long memory. So anyway, that's how I would respond to that. Matt, yes. Matt, yes. we probably got time for one more. And um, Manu, do you have another question in there, first of all, Nat? Um, someone just, I think as he was speaking, someone asked what was the difference, and I'm not sure exactly what they have that, and someone's asking whether or not he thinks we will ever end racialized police brutality. Okay. If you want so, to do those, but yeah, yeah. You, can, you can choose. Can, can, can you mash them up for us, Brother Manu? But also, would you please give us your website so that people can have further contact with everyone that signed up for um, the conversation today. Your names, if you're not already on our mailing list, you will go on our mailing list. Your names will also be shared with Manu so he'll be able to communicate with you directly. But also if you would take down his website. Here's the important thing. We sell the book that is part of, um, uh, not part of, but, but it actually is the research that Manu did. We sell that, but the death of Willie Lynch and Manu's research is on his website as well. So you can purchase the book, you can download it from his uh, website, you can do whatever you wanna do. It's really great with us. The point is this information has to get out. So Manu, can, can you, I guess, respond to the question, please, or questions in a summary way, but also tell us what, can you share with us what's going on? What are you looking forward to doing in the near future that folks might be interested in joining you on? Okay, I, I appreciate it. Uh, let's see, I saw a message. I'm sorry, what, what, what was the most immediate question? I. I saw a question. Oh, somebody asked, is the, the confessor deceased? I don't know. Uh, he was around last year. Uh, Kwame Nafasi Mashanti. So uh, maybe he's around. I know someone was trying to reach him for an interview a few months ago. They couldn't reach him. So I, I have no idea if he's still around or not. Uh, but again, his confession letter is certainly in my book. And uh, besides, you can go online and probably hear some of his recent uh, interviews since we forced him out. He, he, he's, he has done some, some interviews. And I think that, um, as, I, as I said, he confessed to writing the <clears throat> fake letter. He said he wrote it in 79 in his confession letter. Later, he stated in a radio interview, he's done many, but he stated that he wrote it in 76. I don't know which year I wasn't there, but I can tell you as a professional researcher, my interrogation of him, he's more likely the, the, the author of the original fake speech. Um, and anything else? Let's see. That's it. Uh, Manu, okay. I think uh, if you can share with us, okay. uh, and I'm sorry, did the website go up? I saw the cover for Willie Lynch go up. I didn't see the website. Was the website there also? I uh, put the website in the, let me, I'll show it. Manumpim.com. Um, yeah, okay, no, that's perfect. That's perfect, Manu. But I'm I'm particularly interested. We, we did have some conversations about what you're looking forward to doing. Yes. Um, and so I'm really interested because you, Willie Lynch is one phase of your research, but you do so much more. And I'm glad you're, you're demonstrating some of it on screen now. Um, yes. And you've been at it for a while. So can you talk a little bit about that and what's coming up? Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, a couple of things I'll share really uh, quickly here is that, yeah, my, my work uh, in Africana studies has taken me to a couple dozen countries over the last 30 years or so. So I just showed you uh, mainnewmpim.com. The other, research, uh, other website is advancing the research. And a couple of things I'll point out here is that um, that I've uh, also published another uh, another another book as well, and um, so one thing that that I would point people to is my work on um, on on our classical African civilization. So this book here, I'll, I'll bring it up, is on um, 
a history of African civilizations. So this work here has been what I uh, teach the students at Contra Costa College. And, um, you know, it's just a small part of the work that I've been doing over the last several decades. So uh, this is what we're promoting. And, you know, uh, having Africana studies as a requirement for students in Africana studies or history is still very rare. It was a thing and a phenomenon in the 70s with the black, you know, black studies movement, but the conservative folks have reversed that. And so now it's, it's, it's back to where we were, very uh, unlikely that someone would take a class in African civilization. So this is, um, so I, I would draw your attention to that. And then one other thing is, is that, you know, I take, uh, I do a lot of field research on a regular basis and people have been wanting to go on my next educational tour. So not this summer, but summer of next year, I'll be taking whoever's interested um, a educational tour to Kemet to really go out in the field and learn from a primary researcher's point of view. Anybody can lead a group, but uh, I'm my, my perspective is a little bit different because it's, it's not from a tourist point of view or, or looking at what other people have done. It's really developing an educational tour based on um, my own primary research. So you can always go to advancingtheresearch.org and you can look at the tour details. So that'll be summer of next year. There's too many uh, unanswered questions about this summer. So I don't plan to, to do traveling this summer, but in the, um, in the winter, I'm gonna continue with my field research. And then next June, the 11th through the 25th, I'll be taking any groups that want to go. So uh, you can always, you know, as Brother Paul said, uh, Black Classic Press, they have a, a mailing list. And then uh, if you're interested in keeping up with my ongoing work, then you can do so. And and like today, for example, just before our session, I had my regular, my regular Africana Studies radio program. So every Sunday I'm live, Africana Studies with Professor Maynou M. Pym. And that's um, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern time. So in fact, I'll put it in the chat. So those are some of the, some of the many things that I do. So you can you know, find me on Facebook. I also have a YouTube channel as well. And you can find some of the new videos that I've uploaded there. So you're always more than uh, welcome. So you know, the Willie Lynch um, is mythology and focusing on it is just a small part of my work. And, and I didn't choose it. This has continued to follow me. I said, you know what? This needs to be addressed. So let's address it and continue to move on as well. <laughs> so, so that's uh, what I would say in general. Brother, brother thank Paul. you. Thank you. And so we're, we're going to close now. And we're going to close again with, with another, another thank you.